it's, it's a big moment really for, for that team to to get over the line and win that if you don't it's, it's very tough to, to pick yourselves up and go again came in the, the day of the game and the manager said does anyone want to say anything about what happened last night no right here we go media and people went in there and saying oh we heard James Miller comes in can you tell us where he lives and stuff like that and they were like Never heard of him, don't know who you're on about. Got pulled off after, what was it, 25, 30 minutes or something in the first game of the World Cup and you're thinking, that's the only game I ever play in the World Cup. Going to be thinking about that for a pretty long time. Hi, I'm Jeff Stelling and this is Football's Greatest. Each week I'll be sitting down with a legend to discuss and debate some of the best exponents of the beautiful game. The players that got you off your seat, the hard men that made you wince and the moments that will stay with you for life. Today we're with a man who has played for 22 Premier League seasons. He's won the Premier League title on three occasions. He's won a Champions League. He has won FA Cups. He's won League Cups. He's got 61 England caps. And out of all of the games that he's played, we're going to ask him to pick his five favourites. It's going to be quite a task. James Milner is with us. Thanks for joining us, James. I'm guessing the Champions League final. Um, you know, where Liverpool have beaten Spurs, that that has to be up there, doesn't it? Yeah, I think so. I think when you have a special day like that, um, the game probably wasn't one of the best games you're ever going to play in, in terms of a spectacle, for sure. I think the early goal uh, changed that. Um, but yeah, to, to the, the occasion, amazing ground to play in. Um, yeah, and, and to get over the disappointment of the year before and the journey we had to the final... Um, and and the same season I think it was the season we got 97 points yeah, in the was. league so coming off that disappointment to f- get that trophy I think if you don't get over the line in that game um, you know who knows what would have happened on that journey for the, for that Liverpool team that might have been a hard one to swallow um, so you know back to back Champions League defeats and 97 points and not winning a league title it's a tough one to bounce back from so um, that was a massive moment for us as a team and as a club and, and for that team on and part of its journey. But yeah, the, the occasion, uh, it's not every day you get to lift uh, big ears. Um, I think Jordan Henderson called it the best moment in his life. Um, would you go that far? I think you always have to say football in life because you don't want to annoy the missus. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. So you've got to be careful. That's so I'll say football in life. Yeah, it's definitely... Uh, yeah. I mean, you'd had a while to think about it as well because I think there was about a three-week gap between your last Premier League game of the season and the Champions League final, yeah, it was strange, um, strange build-up. I think we, I think we had a bit of time off, and then I think we went on a training camp to Spain, and we had a team from uh, Portugal, I think, who played in the style of how we thought Spurs were going to play. I think that's that that was that year, and how we prepared for it, and practicing penalties the usual, and meetings with the manager, and team meetings ourselves about dealing with scenarios in the game and you know not always like if things were going your way if things um, were going against you but if things went your way you know if you go a goal up try not to like take a step back and protect what you've got and things like that so um, yeah it was a long build up but being there the year before helped us so much yeah for sure it helped us so much so, but having gone the goal up early on I mean it was the second minute wasn't it did you take a step back yeah, I think I think we we did exactly what we didn't want to do and what we talked about. You're right, yeah. Um, so that meeting was a complete waste of time, but yeah, it's it, we managed to get the job done, and that that was the main thing. I think obviously Divock getting the second um, helped, but um, yeah, I think it's strange. I think if if we hadn't got that early goal, you know, I'm confident we'd have still got the win. But I think the performance would have been a lot better, and it, it may, maybe it would have been a lot. You know, maybe a better game if you like, but I think once we had that, um, you know, not too much happened after that. Yeah, I don't suppose you care whether it's a good game, do you, once you've won it? No, I mean, then that's finals. No one cares. It yeah. doesn't matter in the slightest what happens in the game. If you're walking out of the st- uh, stadium with that trophy at the end, that's the only yeah. thing anybody cares about. Yeah, I think Jurgen Klopp had said, you know, it, it was basically all down to fight because there was there was no fuel left in the tank after the sort of season you'd had. Yeah, and and, and like, yeah, touched on it before, the journey we'd had, obviously losing in the Champions League final the year before, um, you know, pushing to the end um, in the in the league title and, and not quite getting there with 97 points. I mean, it's obscene amount of points to not to not win the league. And then, like you say, it's, it's, it's a big moment, really, for, for that team to to get over the line and win that if you don't it's it's very tough to to pick yourselves up and go again with how well the team had performed and and not quite managed to get over the line 
I'd probably have to say this scoreline twice. Uh, Liverpool 4, Barcelona 0. Liverpool 4, Barcelona 0. I, that has to be the, the greatest night ever at Anfield, wasn't it? You yeah, three 0 down it, from the first leg. Yeah, it stands out for sure as, as as the best for me. I think just the the backstory around it. Obviously, I mean the first leg we didn't play badly, and you know, um, you know, Messi scores an incredible free kick, and and they get the goals. They had a breakaway chance late in 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 that game as well, and if they score that as well, you know, then it's, is it out of reach? Um, but then the build up to the next game and we needed City to drop points the night before and Vinny goes and seen him do it a hundred times in training, slice it into the bushes and he decides to slice it into the top corner this time. And, you know, we came in the, the day of the game and the manager said, does anyone want to say anything about what happened last night? No, right, here we go. And again, like you say, pushing, pushing. We'd had a, a big game on the Saturday trying to stay in the league title against Newcastle who, who fought to the end and we managed to nick a, nick a win there. Lost a couple of players injured. Obviously, Mo wasn't available. Uh, a couple of others. And you you go into it and you think everything's stacked against you. Looks like that the league's not going to happen. Um, so to be able to then do, I mean, beat Barcelona like that anyway, um, is pretty amazing. But around all that around it, players missing, what had happened the night before, disappointment. And just the manner we went about it, um, the manager, you know, said before the game, you know, it's pretty impossible to get through this, but there is a small chance and the only chance we've got is because it's you. And it was just a calmness around it. Everyone believed, but the whole game, I remember getting a corner the first minute and um, the roar for a corner, like it's ob obscene really. And even when we got that first goal on the pitch, it was just a calmness around like next step right get a goal it wasn't ever panicked we have to score now we just seem to pick away it bit by bit and I think the tone was set actually obviously Suarez who incredible play for Liverpool the fans loved him standing over the kickoff and getting booed and whistled and I think it was just a reminder not today mate you're not you're not one of us today and that probably helped set the tempo for the game really and when I looked at that Barcelona side as well you know you mentioned Suarez, we've mentioned Messi, Coutinho, Busquets, Jordi Alba, PK. I mean, it's a phenomenal side. In your heart of hearts, even when you've gone 1-0 up, even when you've gone 2-0 up, did you, did you really believe you could do it? Yeah, I think, I think you know, getting the early goal helped, but I think we, we did. I think, like I said, there was a calmness around it. I think the amount of points we got that year, we knew we could beat anyone. Um we had a similar game against Dortmund a few years before and we know the magic of Anfield and what can happen there and like you say against an experienced team like that um, you know how we played at that time we could go through spells and games and really rattle teams how we played heavy metal football and keep the ball in play quick turnovers you know a few tackles let them know you're there um, a few moments and you know you have to respect them but you also have to say you know you can't have it all your own way because the players are that level if you do then they're going to walk all over you so yeah it was one of those nights that with the players that were missing and it was an amazing thing as well because it was such a squad effort and the whole season obviously is to achieve something like that but with the players that were missing it showed how well the boys mentality was to be ready and step in but also how well coached the team was that you could make changes like that or have to make changes like that for a game like that and players come in and play as well as they did like Shark and Divock and and, and the amount of important goals he scored um, Genie obviously not playing and, and was pretty annoyed and used that in the right way yeah, uh, scored twice didn't he yeah, yeah. incredible so yeah, and yeah losing Robbo at half time as well um, yeah was, how yeah. did you feel about that because uh, I guess he was the man who ultimately I'm not sure he can man mark Messi or not but but wasn't he given the task of looking after him yeah I think it, it, whenever he came into your, your area right. it was, yeah, I think it was a, a, a team thing obviously but Robbo done you know amazing things for us and, and he's obviously always going to be a big miss with his energy and, and things like that and having to go into left back because he went off wasn't ideal obviously having to come up against players like that but um, again it's, it's just whatever you can do for the team to, to to get you over the line and manage to find a way and 
I remember Hendo actually had a bad knee. I think he was on a bike at half time and so players hanging on with injuries and things like that. And the final whistle went, we were keeping it in the corner and I've turned around and Hendo's got a knee slide to the fans and his knee got caught in the ground. And he's like, why have I just done that? He's like nearly crying in pain from his knee, not because we'd got to the uh, final. Yeah. I mean, the atmosphere on those European nights at Anfield just is impossible to beat, isn't it? Yeah, incredible. Um you know, from the start and you look at the cop and, and, and the banners and the flags up and, you know, you'll never walk alone. And, um, yeah, it's, it was important and they, they're always up for the nights anyway, but also it's important as a team, they see that you're at it and can you get the first tackling? Can you get the first press and get the fans right with you? And that was always important for us that we had to start well to get them really with you and let the other team feel the atmosphere, feel our pressure and, and think this isn't an ordinary game and this isn't going to be something we've experienced before. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sure you all thought you could do it. I know every Liverpool fan thought they could do it. I was sitting at home watching the TV and thought, no chance. <laughs> <laughs> Now, thanks for watching Football's Greatest on YouTube. But can I ask you, please, to hit that subscribe button. That way you won't miss any of our future episodes and we have some great guests coming up on the show. Let, let's talk about a couple of England games. Um, your debut against the Dutch. How was that? Yeah. Um, yeah, it was one of those. I'd, 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 I was in the squad and I think I've been in a few squads before and not been on the bench. Um, I think travelled to Kazakhstan, actually, and didn't get on on the Ooh. bench so that was quite a flight that's a for, long way yeah, to go isn't not it for, a, uh, yeah. for nothing but um, yeah just remember Stuart Pearce saying quick get your kit off before he changes his mind he's coming on um, and went on and I think we were 2-0 down and, and managed to turn it around to 2 all. so it, it was nice to be able to come on and have an impact and find them at your England debut after so many under-21s games and, and you know against Holland as well even though it, it was a friendly it was it, it's, a, it's a tough team to play away from home against What what was it like yeah being in, in the England squad then with, you know, obviously the likes of, of Beckham and John Terry and Wayne Rooney and Frank Lampard, you know, Ashley Cole, you know, a lot of brilliant players, a lot of big characters as well. Yeah, for sure. And um, you, you, have to, you, have, you have to be ready for it to be able to deal with that um, expectation. Um uh, and and you know you've earned the right to be there, but you have to show them that you're good enough to be there. Um, first trip, he gets slung in front of the media and fu uh, a full room and a press conference and, and cameras everywhere and um, a room full of journals. That's that's your first test as well. As soon as you get there, it's, it's slung in front of that and dealing with that. Um, and then yeah, um, obviously you know a few boys from twenty ones and things. So I think that always helps and and playing against the guys, but. Um, it's like joining a new team. You have to find your place in the squad socially and, and who you get on with and things like that. And then on the pitch, you know, the tempo of the training was through the roof and everyone was flying around. You know, I remember the first possession and the ball's pinging around like a pinball. And, you know, you're playing at a good level in the Premier League, but it's, it, you know, your first time at England and emotions are heightened. And, um, yeah, with the players you've named, it, it was a squad full of superstars. So it, it was one that you had to get on onto the right page pretty quick. And, and you are so modest that you haven't mentioned the fact that you laid on the equalising goal. Yeah, I think it was uh, Jermaine Defoe, was it? Um, yeah. Just remember a ball, a, a loosish bouncing ball being played across the pitch and it was one of those that I think I can get it and I've gone and the guy's gone with his foot trying to kick it and I've put my head in there and he's kicked me and I've managed to head the ball and go down the wing and pull it across and JD put it in. So that was great to have an impact and a, an impact on the game after coming on and making your debut. Yeah. A couple of the early games to ask you about. Um, the, the debut in the win um, at, uh, at West Ham. Uh, and this is for Leeds, obviously. And then your first goal. Well, in fact, let's talk about that one first, shall we? That was um, at Sunderland, wasn't it? Yeah, Boxing Day, yeah. I think I'd come on as an early sub. I think someone got injured. Um I think it was Alan, Alan Smith, wasn't it? Was it? Yeah. Because yeah. I think then the 28th, I think it was Kiel got injured. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I think it was Jason Wilcox went down the left and managed to make a run across the front post and, and slide it in. And uh, yeah, probably more a, a feeling of surprise as that just happened sort of feeling when it when it went in. Um, and, we, and we were doing overly well at the time, so it was important to get the win. It, it was a big win. Um, and yeah, amazing feeling, obviously scoring for your hometown club and... Um, 
in, in the Premier League uh, at such a young age. Yeah, I mean, at the time you're just thinking, can I get in the team? Can I make yeah. an impact? Can I score? Keep your head down. But when you think back now and think, well, I was doing my GCSEs like five months before and things like that. It, it's pretty ridiculous now when you see how young I was. You know, the size of the kits on you. It was one size fits all and long sleeve shirts and. If it had been windy, it'd probably blown away. It was, um, yeah, it's madness, really. Yeah. So at the time, you were the youngest ever Premier League goal scorer, like three days younger than Wayne Rooney. So, I mean, you were headlines everywhere, weren't you, at the time? How did you, at that age, how did you cope with that sort of celebrity? Yeah, I mean, the club are very good. They didn't let me do any media. I didn't do anything like that. They, they kept me shied away um, from that. Um the games came thick and fast. We played on the 28th and I scored again at Ellen Road, um, which even though the first one was, you know, the, the first, I think the one at Ellen Road and the 28th, probably I remember more fondly, even though like two amazing moments, but it probably edges it because it was at Ellen Road. I've been there watching Leeds for years and years. You know, it's Christmas, family's there, mates are there from school. Um, this must have been the best Christmas ever. Yeah, probably, yeah. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I couldn't drive to training, obviously, because I was too young. So I remember the kit man coming to pick me up to take me to training Christmas Day um, because my dad wanted want to drink Christmas Day or whatever, wanted to enjoy it. So he came, I was like, ah, don't worry, I'll, I'll come around and pick him up. So he came and picked me up and, and drove me to training because I was, I was too young to drive. Um, yeah, and then and on the 28th coming on, I think it was for Harry Kuehl and getting a ball. And I just remember Alan Smith screaming for the for the pass and I shot and it went in. So that was lucky because he, he did definitely give me a, an earful if, if it didn't go in. But um, yeah, and then everyone just jumped on on top of us on, on the celebration. It, it was class, um, class feeling. And um, yeah, I remember people ringing the house and agents and things like that and people we used to go to the cricket club across the road and a few people uh, media and people went in there and saying oh we heard James Miller comes in can you tell us where he lives and stuff like that and they were like never heard of him don't know who you're on about so that was pretty good so at 16 there were some big names in, in, in your side you know, how did they treat you did they treat you as an equal oh they were brilliant Absolutely brilliant. You know, you look at people like Don Matty, who was the captain, David Batty, Leeds lad, Alan Smith, um, Gary Kelly. Um, you know, they made sure that you did what you needed to do. And, you know, I kept doing my jobs and things like that and kept grounded and spoke when sp spoken to. And you didn't want to... Um, you didn't, you didn't want to stand out, really. You just wanted to be under the radar, stand out on the pitch, but off the pitch, keep your head down. Mark Viduca took me under his wing. I always used to joke around. He used to call me Millie, Millie Vanilli. And he used to tell me the story about Millie Vanilli three times a week. He's like, have you ever heard of Millie Vanilli? Yeah, the, 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 the mind on stage and the CD stopped or whatever. And he used to tell me that all the time. But th they were amazing with me. And I was still doing jobs. I was still doing the skips with the kit man, picking dirty slips up off the floor, even though I'd scored in the Premier League, cleaning boots. And I, because I was so young, I had two first teams. I had the under-19s captain. So I was cleaning the under-19s captain's boots. And I was playing in the first team. Um, and then I remember a game in January and the kit man after the game, he said, go and get on the bus. And that was me graduating. Wow. I'd earned my stripes and felt a million dollars. Great feeling. Apart yeah. from Nigel Martin, he always used to like do a crossword and he'd always say, oh, what's, uh, what do you put a golf ball on? Three letters. T, yeah, I'll have two sugars. <laughs> go, go, do, go do the teas. Brilliant. I do hope you're enjoying the show. I just want to tell you that you can follow us at, at football's greatest pod on Instagram, TikTok and Facebook. And search for Football's Greatest Pod to find us on X. So look, uh, the next one I think is back back to England and it's, it's probably actually, the, the game you mentioned isn't, isn't a game that will live long in the memory of a lot of England fans because it was against the USA in the World Cup. Um, but I think that's the backstory, isn't it, that you played in that mm. um, when maybe you shouldn't have done. Yeah, it was the World Cup and uh, first game, obviously you dream of making your debut in a World Cup for England. Um, got over there and had a pretty bad illness for probably a week before the first game. Since we got there, I was in my room on my own, wasn't allowed out of the room. Lost about four or five kilos. Um, was trying to eat after the boys had gone, so I didn't pass it on to anyone. No idea what it was. Um, didn't train for... A, and the manager obviously had in his head that that was the team he wanted to play. And obviously... 
you know, you're never going to turn that down. Do you think mm. you can do it? 100% of course I can do it. Uh, picked up an early booking and um, obviously I didn't want to risk me getting sent off and um, yeah, got pulled off after, what was it, 25, 30 minutes or something in the first game of the World Cup and you're thinking, if that's the only game I ever play in the World Cup, I'm uh, going to be thinking about that for a pretty long time. Um, didn't play the second game. Um, things didn't go too well and then it was an important third game and managed to create the goal for JD again I think it was um, and we and we went through and yeah that was that that was nice that that happened and yeah it was unfortunate but um, yeah it was it wasn't wasn't the best first game in a World Cup yeah, it's an impossible decision though isn't it you, you're always going to say yeah, yes and, Gaffer and I want to play I think I trained a couple of days before and I actually did feel okay myself but obviously you're not going to be your level I wasn't struggling or anything like that I did feel fine but I was coming out the other end of it but um, you know losing four or five kilos in weight um, it's probably not, not, not going to be but uh, ultimately it's the manager's decision and if he wants you to play you're never going to say no if you feel like you can it's, it's if he thinks it's the right thing the team he's got all the information and and you do what you can hmm. you went on to play in the last 16 game against Germany didn't you as well yeah and that, that was the Famous, the infamous, the Frank Lampard ghost goal, which almost bust the net, but was deemed not to be over the line. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a frustrate one of the frustrating things actually, because you look at that game and you think I think it was two 0 down, and then we get one, mm. I think, didn't we? And and then Lamps does that, and my my viewpoint, I'm playing on the right wing. I'm pretty sure the linesman's about five yards to my right with a better view than me, and I could see it was over from where I was. So he's got a better angle, it's not given. And then obviously we know what happened after that. But you think 2-0 up to 2-all two, two going in just before half time, you think things could have been a lot different there. Yeah, uh, you've got the momentum then, haven't you? Yeah, and it's a game changer. You didn't include in your favourite games, which I think people would, would wonder about, um, Man City 3, QPR 2, which is the one that obviously won City the title with the Aguero. Yeah. moment at the end because you were on the bench weren't you? was that frustrating yeah it was frustrating and um, yeah as part of being part of something you know you never really I mean it was, it was an incredible day and incredible to be part of it and, and, and loved it for sure obviously and you feel like you've blown a whole season's work you know cup finals one thing it's terrible losing a cup final I've done it enough it's, it's an awful feeling but when you've got a league title you lose it on the last day after all that work and having it in your hands so we've had that feeling to four minutes later, the full turnaround or whatever it was, you know, that roller coaster of emotions was unbelievable. So to be to be involved in that was was amazing for sure. But obviously you don't play and the manager was very superstitious. So he we had to win. We got to a point, I think, where we had to win the last six games, I think it was. He made the same changes and the same subs and the same team as, as much as he could for the last six games. And unfortunately, in the game, the first game of that run, I don't think I came on. And from that point, I think he was very superstitious and kept it the same. Yeah. So that that was why. Yeah, frustrating. You played 37 games that season for the most. So I think you yeah. played a pretty full part in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I felt like I played a part. And yeah. it's just obviously frustrating when you don't yeah. play the last game. But, you know, you, you know it's a full season's work and a full squad wins a league title. The best team always wins the league. That's the beauty of winning the league title. The best team always wins it from 38 games. Um, so, you know, you, you know you've played your part and it starts the first game of the season to the last. You've got injuries, suspensions, hot days, cold days, windy days, days where you travelled and you've been in Europe, like all these things to deal with. It's such an amazing achievement to do it. And, you know, when you grow up and, and you're playing and you want to play in the Premier League, you don't, I wasn't necessarily thinking about winning a Premier League. I was thinking, you know, can I play for Leeds? Can I be a footballer? And then, you know, you start, well, how, can you go and win a league title? And it's, you know, you, there's you, not loads and loads of people have won the, the, the Premier League, you know, so it was, it was great. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, we've, we've talked about six or seven. We've only got seven or eight hundred more to talk about, James. <laughs> Look, thank, thanks very much for coming sure in, James. Man. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we've reached the end of Football's Greatest. My thanks to James Milner for joining us today. Next time on Football's Greatest, Paul Merson names his greatest ever Mavericks. And I went in and I got out there at five in the morning. Oh. And I played first game of the season. Mickey, Swin Mickey Quinn scored a hat-trick. And the manager absolutely slaughtered me after the game. He brought me off and he said, you lot should, you should beat him up. 
If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode of Football's Greatest. And of course, if you're listening to us on your favourite podcast platform, please press follow so you get us in your feed every week. Thanks for joining us. Football's Greatest is a Folding Pocket production with BBC Studios.